Hello, my name is Jo Lambert. I'm the lead specialist teacher for physical and neurological impairment in Essex. This is a short presentation explaining the basics of supporting children with medical needs in a school setting. It was originally presented at our SENCO conference in September 2017. This introductory training video has been developed for Essex school staff. You may wish to have a notepad handy for any notes and please remember you can pause the training at any point. You can download this training as a PDF by following the link in the description below. The PDF will enable you to use any of the hyperlinks referred to during this training. Children with medical needs often have multiple diagnoses with accompanying paperwork and descriptions of medical procedures which can seem quite scary. Hopefully having watched this presentation you will feel more confident and better able to manage their needs. In Essex we come across a range of medical needs which is probably representative of the country as a whole. It's impossible to name every single condition or place them into a specific category but on this slide we've grouped them into broad areas some of which will coexist with others. I'm going to take you through each one and give an example of each. So first Neurological impairments could include children with epilepsy and acquired brain injury. Bowel and bladder conditions such as Hirschsprungs and spina bifida might mean that a child requires catheterisation or a stoma bag and therefore support with intimate care in school. By degenerative and or life limiting conditions we mean conditions such as the muscular dystrophies and spinal muscular atrophy. Support in early years might be minimal but need to increase as the condition develops. There are numerous conditions which can affect eating and drinking. In school you are likely to come across children who require some form of tube feeding or have a high risk of choking and or aspiration. Type 1 diabetes, some bowel diseases and rheumatoid arthritis are all examples of autoimmune diseases where the body attacks itself and therefore leaves the child at greater risk of contracting infections. Such children may well be able to manage their own needs with greater independence over time. Some children present with a rare genetic condition or an undiagnosed condition. In these instances we look at the individual child and how their condition appears to be impacting on their learning and well-being at school. Children with heart and or respiratory conditions can require close monitoring and administering of oxygen or other medication, which will be carefully recorded in their care plan, which we will talk about later. You may have noticed that we have not listed cerebral palsy as a separate condition, as a child may have cerebral palsy with no other medical needs, or conversely, they may have cerebral palsy and a range of other medical needs, such as epilepsy and eating difficulties. Of course, each child is an individual and one size doesn't fit all. However, there are aspects of having a medical need that affect many of our children and have similar effects on their well-being and learning, and we have listed them on the following slides. The first area is absence from school. This can be for medical appointments, which can sometimes take a whole day and are unavoidable. Some children have long periods of absence, such as children undergoing chemo or radiotherapy, whilst others might have frequent shorter absences as they are more prone to infections. Absence from school can impact on the child's sense of belonging and friendships at school, as well as the more obvious missing of classwork and social events in school, such as productions and trips. Self-esteem is often affected in pupils with medical needs and can worsen as they become older and more aware of their differences between themselves and their peers. Clearly, poor self-esteem can manifest itself differently in different children, but you may notice a change in behaviour, demeanour and engagement in learning or social interactions. Fatigue is a really big one. It can be a real challenge to slow a child down who wants to join in every aspect of school life and keep up with their friends at break times. But sometimes, if this isn't managed effectively, a child can experience higher levels of fatigue, pain and absence later on. Even if a child isn't overly exerting themselves, you may see a decline in their performance towards the end of a morning, a day, a week or a half term, as their condition makes them tired full stop. It will be important for you to build in appropriate rest breaks and some flexibility with the timetable and activities. Next, we come on to achieving independence. 
And by this, we mean a child having opportunities to participate in their care routines with varying degrees of independence, depending on their age and level of ability. For example, a child with a stoma could be encouraged to assist in getting their equipment ready and begin to talk through the steps involved in emptying and changing the bag. Toileting needs often accompany children with other medical needs and your school may need to consider accessible toileting facilities as well as training for staff such as catheterisation. Talk to the school nurse if available for appropriate advice or ask your PNI specialist teacher if you have one. A question we often get asked is whether schools need to have two members of staff present for intimate care procedures. The answer is no unless manual handling requires two people or there is a history of false allegation against staff at the school. If you want to find out more about this aspect, please refer to the Essex Local Offer pages where you can find a document on managing intimate care needs in schools. Not all children with medical needs require the administering of medication in school. However, for those who do, there will need to be a clear healthcare plan in place which details the procedures, staffing and record keeping. I will talk about healthcare plans in greater depth in the next section. It is really crucial that children with medical needs are able to access all areas of school life, including trips, clubs and PE and so on. A diagnosis alone is not a reason for a child to miss out on outdoor play or PE. However, if medical evidence is provided that states they need to avoid contact sports, for example, this advice needs to be followed and a suitable alternative provided. So, now that you have an awareness of the typical difficulties facing children with complex medical needs, what to do next? The first thing to do is to compile a daily healthcare plan, which needs to be a workable document rather than reams of paperwork. This should contain contact details for the child's GP and parents, as well as what to do in an emergency. This plan can be drawn up with the parents and school nurse if available. It should be agreed and signed by the parents, and the names of those staff who have a copy should be written on the document. This is so that when you collect out-of-date copies following a review of the HCP, you can check everyone has returned their copy and you can shred them. This helps to prevent mistakes with medication levels that might be out of date, for example. The healthcare plan should be readily available to supply staff and all staff should be familiar with the emergency procedures. Secondly, you may need to organise training. There are lots of specialist nurses or staff available who may be linked to a particular hospital or community. Book your training early. Consider how many people to train and think of a backup plan if one of those staff members is off sick one day, for example. Ensure you obtain the correct level of signing off on training. Some medical staff are happy for the parent to demonstrate a procedure. However, this will clearly not be appropriate in some cases. We always advise that schools follow NHS professionals' advice rather than that of parents if there is a discrepancy. Hopefully, good planning and working as a team can help minimise discrepancies. You will need to check your facilities. For instance, do you have an accessible toilet and space for therapy or administering medication? Many so-called accessible toilets in schools are not actually accessible for the particular child in question. Here in Essex, we try our hardest to accommodate children in their desired school and are sometimes able to make adaptations to buildings to make them more accessible. If you suspect that you may need this kind of alteration, please speak to your PNI specialist teacher as soon as possible. Liaise with the preschool setting, if relevant, to ascertain what the child's toileting needs might be. Supplies and medication need to be safely stored in a locked cupboard if this is medication. Check that medication is in date and that you know the appropriate dosage. A logbook is advised to record dates and times. Log any concerns and conversations with parents. It can also be used to inform medical professionals in terms of managing medication levels. For example, a child with epilepsy might be experiencing more than usual seizures, and there may be a pattern to this, which is easier to detect if there are clear records in place. Consider staffing and facilities for off-site visits and risk assessments. 
You can find out more about planning inclusive off-site visits on the Essex local offer pages or you can ask your specialist teacher. The key is in planning well in advance for the child with medical needs. Think about emergency procedures, access, eating and drinking and toileting among other things so that the child is safely included along with their peers. In some instances pupils with medical needs miss out on lesson time so you will need to consider how to manage the time to catch up on work. Think about what's really important, be specific and prioritise. Can you provide the child with copies of handouts and presentations to highlight for example? Are there key concepts and vocabulary you want them to grasp? Some children can get highly anxious about missed work, so it is important that they know it's not their fault. If the child is off for a long period of time, they may receive tuition in the hospital, or in some cases at home, but this may only be for a couple of hours a week. Clearly the social side of things also needs to be maintained, as friendships can move on while the child is absent. Can the class keep in touch via Skype and cards? If the child is well enough, can they still come to special events at school? If in doubt about any of this, please do ask for help, either from the medical professionals involved or from your specialist teacher. Parents and the child themselves can be extremely helpful in finding solutions to any issues. This will be your go-to book if you receive a child with medical needs in your setting, as it contains guidance, and explanations of roles and responsibilities, as well as templates for daily healthcare plans. You can access the link to this guidance in the PDF mentioned at the beginning. Another useful publication is the Dignity and Inclusion book by Jean Carlin, which also has examples of healthcare plans and risk assessment information. It is perfectly natural for children to ask questions about why a child might be going off with a member of staff during lesson time to have a procedure, for example, as well as the child with medical needs themselves asking questions about their condition. It is important to answer questions at an age-appropriate level of understanding, as simply and as factually as possible. You will need to agree with the child's parents about what terminology to use so that the child does not receive mixed messages or find out more from you than they would have done at home if they and their parents are not ready for this yet. Often the child's medical condition will be a lifelong condition which they will have to learn to live with and manage themselves. Developing self-awareness, resilience and positive self-image from a young age are crucial in developing coping strategies and the ability to self-manage their condition. Keeping the child at the centre of all planning and involving them in decision making is more likely to work well. Children's views need to be heard and acted upon, even if this can be a challenge at times, if they do not want to take their medication or undergo their physio exercises, for example. This is where the model of one planning really helps, as the child can often be helped to see that the outcomes they are striving for require perseverance with aspects of their medical care. There are lots of storybooks about various conditions available from charities and other sources, such as Sam has a stoma. Again, with parental permission, circle time can be a really good place to talk about the child's condition. We often find that instances of questioning reduce when clear explanations are given and children just move on. Scope has some good materials on disability awareness. Not every child with a medical need will require additional funding and the PNI team certainly do not have involvement with every child with a medical need in Essex. This may differ across the country, but here in Essex, schools are expected to pay approximately £6,000 from their delegated budget before receiving any additional funding from the local authority. If you find that you are regularly going over and above this and a need for additional resources has been identified, Clear evidence should be provided as to how you are either already using support or are intending to. A request for specialist teacher input should be made if appropriate and any relevant medical evidence, timetables of support and a covering letter should be sent to your local statutory assessment service. Talk to your caseworker if you aren't sure what to include. At the SENCO conference, 
we asked delegates to get into groups and discuss these fictitious case studies, which have been based on amalgamations of real children. Omar has a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. His family has moved into the area and he is a reception age child. He has a pump which bleeps when insulin levels are either too high or too low. He has no learning difficulties. Chloe has bowel and bladder difficulties which have resulted in a stoma bag being fitted. She is in year one. She refuses to look at her stoma bag whilst it's being changed and often becomes tearful when being taken to the toilet. Alex has a heart condition. He has a care plan provided by Adam Brooks. He has already had three heart attacks, the most recent of which was on the toilet at home. His parents are very anxious. If you're watching this on your own, you could think about what you need to put in place if the child is attending your school, arrives at your school at short notice, or has a new diagnosis. Or you could do this in groups at your next staff meeting. You may want to consider the following. How might the medical need impact on the child? Who do you need to liaise with? What constitutes an emergency? Do you have appropriate facilities and equipment? Are there any training requirements for staff? What provision is needed to support the child? We've come to the end of the presentation, which I hope you found useful. Do have a look at the Essex Local Offer and the PNI Pinterest pages for further ideas and support. If you have any further questions, please contact your PNI specialist teacher or you can contact me at joe.lambert at essex.gov.uk.